Well, hello there, and welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Comrade Vice Chairman Fred Bell, and today we are moving through the balance of the Allied Air Forces now at the, uh, the beginning to the end and the middle, wherever we're going, of World War II. And today, obviously, we're with one of the Allies, Greg. Where are we going with this? We are with Mother Russia. Now, Greg has gone all in on this. As you can tell, I've got my little Russian hat on, and you're not gonna believe the drink. I don't even understand where he gets some of this stuff. My obstreperous assistant is moving through it, and uh, he digs up all this stuff, but it deals a deal. So today I'm in a, what is this, a Russian bear hat? I, I'm not really sure what this is. I will tell you this, Greg, it's a bit warm, but we're in Palm Springs in season, so maybe that doesn't work very well. So today we are talking about Soviet aircraft, and we're going to start with Everybody knows about the MiG, and when you think about the MiG, what do you think about? We've already done one in the Cold War, which was the MiG-15. In fact, we did all the MiGs. We ran through all of them, the Cold War MiGs, but the MiG goes back a lot further than that. In fact, this MiG, the MiG-3, goes back to 1940 was its first flight. It was designed at a time, we've talked about the Italians, and the Italians and the Germans were in these proxy wars, the Russians and the rest of the Allies, the British, uh, and anybody in that area was rearming frantically. The MiG-3 is a product of the Allies that knew war was coming, and we've seen the Spitfire and the Hurricane in the, in the British side. The Russians were doing the same thing. This airplane was rushed in production. It was the product of the MiG-1. It would ultimately be developed into the I-211, which never really went anywhere. But this aircraft actually first flew in 1940. It was introduced in 1941. By the time the Germans unleashed Operation Barbarossa on the, uh, on the Russians, there were 981 of them in service. So they were rearming. So I'm gonna throw up a plan view. Greg can throw up a plan view of this fighter. It looks like an interceptor. It's a great looking airplane. The reality was it was supposed to be designed as a high altitude fighter, but in Europe, as we would come to find out, all across Europe, most of the actual combat took place at uh, intermediate altitudes. It didn't take place at high altitude, and this aircraft, we're gonna get into why it was ill-suited for that. So, as I said, there were about just under a thousand of them in service. Uh, by the time the war started with the Germans, when the Germans invaded. Another very low build rate. This aircraft had 3,422 built, so it was very low build rate. Uh, it was inferior to the BF-109, the comparable aircraft, and we'll talk about the rest of them in a minute, but this was comparable to a 109F, a BF-109F, which in and of itself on the German side was not a, you know, they built a lot of E's, they didn't build a lot of F's, and they built a lot of G's. But this was kind of an, um, a, a comparable aircraft to that. In the other Allied inventory at that time, the usual suspect, it was comparable to a Spitfire, the Yak-1, which we talked about, the HE-100, the French, the D-502, the P-40, and the Japanese, the KI-61. So we kind of run a whole gamut of fighters that this thing was actually pretty comparable to. What happened at high altitude was the Russians were not trained to fly this airplane, airplane at high altitude. Remember, when the war actually started with the Germans, the Russians were throwing everything they could in there to try to slow the Germans down. The, the aircraft that did go up at high altitude had a tendency to spin, and they, they were unrecoverable spins. In many instances, there's an instance where they set up sent up five of these aircraft, three of them spun, all three pilots had to bail out, one of the pilots was killed on the bailout. So they were, they were not uh, uh, terribly stable when you get up into that thin air, and so, and there was another problem with them, although they are very well armed, and Greg can show up a cutaway, uh, throw up a cutaway on the armament. So unlike, we talked some of those Italian airplanes, which actually performed really well and didn't have enough guns, this one performed really poorly, but it was fairly well-armed. And it 
what happened, it was uh, on a speed, it was in the almost up at altitude at 400 miles an hour, but when you brought it down into that thicker air in the intermediate altitudes, it lost its speed advantage, and that's where it had a real problem as it fought its way on the, uh, on the Russian front. Now, statistically, this aircraft had the highest loss rate percentage, the number of aircraft that were shot down, the number of these that were shot down of any Soviet fighter in the war. So with a low build rate, that's one of the reasons why we're going to talk about there are very few of these left. Uh, the designer, uh, Mikolai Grechiev, Grechiev with MIG, I, I'm going to go with that, uh, was actually awarded the Stalin State Prize in 1941 for his design work on aircraft. But as I said, there were a lot of defects with this um, aircraft as they went to the front. And Greg, how do you think the Russians took the fact that the airplane had a lot of defects in it? The Russians are not exactly, let me put it this way, the guy didn't get a bad performance review. The, um, the production defects were so bad that Major General A.I. Fillin was actually executed. He was taken out and summarily executed for the number of defects in this airplane. So if you had a job problem in the uh, Soviet Union at that time, you really didn't want to complain to your supervisor because you just might get shot. So, and that's what happened to him. Uh, as I said, it was just under uh, 400 mile, miles an hour, so it was, it was quick. Uh, it, there are aircraft that have been rebuilt, but the Russian power plants and these inline, uh, these, I'm sorry, these V-12s, these uh, engines did not have uh, tremendous uh, performance or reliability. So we're starting to see a pattern here. A lot of that has to do with the fact that they're liquid cooled. And on liquid cooled engines, you get, you, the, the tolerances are so tight that if you've got a design problem and a defect problem, as you had with this airplane, uh, it, it's a recipe for disaster. So the airplane uh, was also a little bit of a, of a maintenance problem as well. Now, if we're going to talk about Greg's step into Mother Russia, Greg has gone all in. And what Greg did today was Greg has found, where do you find this stuff? I, I don't need, now this one I have, I, the bottle's so dark, so I can't tell whether there is a potential poisoning incident here. See if there's any, uh, any fizz in this. But this is red cola. Uh, Join the revolution. So um, this is actually something to do with Russia, and it is tyrannythemovie.com. So whatever tyranny the movie is, the Russians, they don't care about calorie counts or any of that kind of stuff. So there is no calorie count on this. Probably the person that bottled this has been shot, if we go along with the, the guy who was uh, doing the MIG stuff, because uh, there's no product information on this at all. So this is a leap of faith, Greg. If I get sick, maybe we follow the Russian example and just a, a long walk and a bullet. What do you think? Well, uh, we're going to go ahead and open this up. Now, what we're going to talk about today, let's talk about the Russians. And I've talked about the Russians before a little bit, but the Russians call World War II the Great pa uh, Patriotic War. And the reason they do that is uh, we talked about the Italians in the last group of the segments. The Italians were really kind of trying to punch up above their weight. They got into a fight with a whole bunch of adversaries that were a lot bigger than they were. And as I said, their leadership was terrible. They had good equipment, but they were poorly led, and the outcome wasn't very good. The Russians, on the other hand, in the uh, Great Patriotic War, took 20 million casualties in that war. Uh, they managed to stay in it with the Germans getting to the gates of Moscow, literally getting right to the gates of Moscow and being pushed back. The battles, both the air battles and the land battles that were fought in Russia were also among the largest battles that have ever been fought on the planet. They were titanic. But you have to, whatever you think about the Russians, uh, whatever the issue is, you've got to give them credit because they stayed in there. They continued to fight. If you look at some of these other countries that were invaded, and we're not going to name names, but they basically threw in the towel. The Russians and the Germans fought to the death and in battles that were so great and so vicious 
that let's hope that for humanity's sake, we never see that again. So we've, we've actually had, and we're going to uh, bring him up, a 100-year-old, we'll, we'll do his airplane as part of the four segments. We've had a, a Russian bomber crewman here when we did the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. But those folks that fought in that war, it was just a terrible experience. And let's hope that we never have to fight something like that again. So with that, comrades, I'm going to take a leap of no terrible aroma. Oh, 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 oh. That's flat, Greg. It's flat. And you know how soda, when it, yeah, there he is. He's covered himself up. Greg, <clears throat> we may have to just take you out, you know. Greg may not be here next episode, but no, it's flat. And you know how soda, when it's bad, it has that sickly sweet taste? This is a good, yeah, thank you, Greg. Second sip, that's what I agree to. This one, uh, Greg may have to take me out and uh, get my stomach pump skied here, I think. Mm. Oh, man. Oh. You're on a roll, man. That, that's like, what, four, I think, that have just been absolute. After three that were really pretty good, another hideous choice. But the bottle is totally apropos to this. So this aircraft can, the MiG-3 can be really described as a stopgap aircraft. It was designed for the war the Russians thought they were going to fight. But like in any war, once you get into combat, all that all those assumptions go out of the window and you're dealing with the reality of, of the fight. The fight was uh, more at intermediate altitudes. This aircraft was relegated more towards ground attack, and you can actually see this one actually has rockets or bombs on it, and, and so it actually has the bomb rails. These aircraft were relegated from point defense to more low altitude attack in their lives and by night they were gradually rotated out of the squadrons and became basically what we call hacks, squadron hacks. And then by the end of the war, by 1945, they were completely gone. Now I don't want to totally, I'm going to use a modern term, I don't want to totally bag on the type, right? It, it, uh, it, it did have some success. Alexander Porkin flew the airplane. He was, um, the third highest Soviet ace, he had 53 victories. A number of his victories were in this aircraft. And I actually went out and read what he said about the airplane. His point was that you had to fly the airplane and discover its tendencies. And if you talk to any great ace, uh, they will tell you that if you can figure out how to fly your airplane to your strengths and to your opponent's weakness, you can achieve aerial victories. That's pretty much what he said about flying this airplane. You had to figure out how to fly it. It was tricky. It was unforgiving. As I said, it was going to spin. But at the end of the day, he figured out how to utilize the airplane's strength and score victories in it. Now, like everything else we've talked about, this is a very, very low build airplane at the 3400. Greg, there are only three that survive. All three of them have been rebuilt without the original Russian engine. They run an Allison power plant in them, so they're running an American engine, which is kind of interesting. Uh, one of which, Greg, is actually in a museum in Virginia, in the United States. So if you go to Virginia, you can actually maybe, if it's, if it's on display, go over and see it. As I said, this is another example of a very rare World War II airplane. Now, if you want to relive uh, World War II and give the gift of coloring to your grandchildren or to someone who maybe Greg wants to color this book, uh, this is the story of World War II by Peter Copeland. This is a coloring book. Now, I want to say that this is a perhaps maybe a coloring book that should come with a little bit of a disclaimer. These are historic incidents. So if you want your grandchild, for instance, covering the retreat from Moscow, which, you know, every kid wants to stay in the lines on the retreat of Moscow, uh, you can go ahead and, and, and do that. I think that's a, that might spark an interesting conversation in your house. And then, of course, there's also, if you want to color the big three at Yalta, which includes Uncle Joe, you can go ahead and uh, have your kids um, 
color that, and then explain uh, the uh, values of capitalism. How, how's that? So uh, this, if you want to order this, this is actually a pretty interesting color book. Uh, go out to the link, have Jason send you one of those out. My name is Fred Bell, and comrades, we cannot do all of this if you don't have your rubles. So if you will hit the link below, send us a few rubles, that's how we fly all these airplanes, or a few dollars, or pesos, or we might even take Bitcoin now, so you can go ahead and, uh, and, and send us some of that. That would be interesting, Greg. We need to find that out. I, I, I know we take stock transfers. I don't know if we take Bitcoin or not or not. We gotta find that one out. Uh, we'll, we gladly will take that because we need your support to keep the aircraft flying. If you come across us on YouTube, Subscribe to the channel if you like what you see. We don't do a lot of snappy stuff, but we do cover interesting airplanes and we cover aircraft that are in our collection or aircraft that are in nobody's collection like we're doing right now, which are extremely rare. So like us on uh, uh, YouTube, subscribe on YouTube, like us on Facebook. We can always use that and forward us to your friends because they want might have a bright Warbird Wednesday. We want them to have that. My name is Fred Bell. I'm the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Have a great day.